again, I think it is important, and I think Alicia, as you pointed out earlier, that you know, again, you know, radium two twenty three is not it is not a palliative agent. Right. It has a it has a survival benefit. Yes, it does. It does after again anecdotally after a couple cycles will help reduce the amount of analgesics that the patient may need. It definitely has a a, a side effect profile that's superior to the old betas and gammas that we used to use that, that clearly did not have a survival benefit. And again, I think that is that is it, it's critical for for the practitioners to understand that that they that they should not look at this as a palliative agent. I think the challenge that people are having with radium-223 is once again fitting it into the whole layering schemata of, of all the different therapies. And I think where most people struggle with is this definition of symptomatic. I think people automatically assume that minimally symptomatic or symptomatic by default means you got to have pain that requires opiate use. And clearly, I think if you wait, if you delay the use of radium to that patient, you've probably missed the window. So, so expand on that. You talked about, hey, if I've got somebody with high volume bone mets based upon charter data, let's say, I'm going to find something. So what is it that, you know, for, for our viewers, Sure. Give us some indicators of you know what other things that they should that we should be looking for. So I, I can say what I look for, which is um, things like an anemia, which I know is is in many cases indicative of infiltration of the bone marrow with with the, the cancer cells. I also look at alkaline phosphatase because it's elevated in, in settings of bone turnover, again indicating that there's activity in the bone. Um, and certainly things like LDH, with, which Oliver Sartor has, has talked about multiple times as being something that can help us predict who's going to be able to, to respond uh, longest and have the best uh, response to that, that treatment. I think my biggest concern, once you find these, these ways to get what the patient needs to, to the patient, is retreatment because it's not approved, not because I don't think it's safe. And, it, and I was actually just talking to, to Oliver uh, uh, last weekend about uh, a case that he's publishing in clinical genitourinary cancer uh, that he treated a patient with 18 cycles of radium. I, I had the same expression as you when I heard this. So he said he initially treated the patient on, on clinical trial, I think the expanded access, then he treated the patient on the retreatment protocol that he has had, and then he treated the patient on insurance. So, and this was all separated by time, so it wasn't 18 cycles in a row, right. but the patient has done exceedingly well, and if you're responding to this treatment, to have the opportunity to retreat, I think, is really important, because I, I, I'm concerned that if I have a patient who's doing very well, and I'm using, you know, whatever criteria I'm using to try to get the patient to therapy, if I need to use it again, because I've run out of other options and they're not working, I'm unable at this current time to get that treatment for, for the patient. Dana, what about you? So clinically, I mean, you, again, you've got a big prostate center. Besides the serologic markers that Alicia talked about, you know, what other clin clinical symptomatology are you trying to use, trying to elicit from the, the patient as well as the caregiver, who, obviously, who sometimes is a family member, a dog, to, to, to really look to get this treatment in, in, in the appropriate window of opportunity, if you will? Well, like Alicia was alluding to, we also use the ALKFOS, the LDH. Um, but it's, and whether you define pain as somebody is using an opioid versus a non-steroidal. Uh, but fatigue is a, is a big thing. They can't get off the couch. And it, probably they're not getting off the couch because they hurt and they just don't want to say it. Men in Texas are very macho. They're not going to complain about a lot of things. But the guy who's sitting there telling you about his uh, mobility issues, I'm not getting around, he's a lot of fatigue. Um, those are the kind of things that we are looking at to try to elicit. Uh, do they really have symptomatology so that we can put them on, put them on drug? Because they are the appropriate patient to, to get started. Uh, our experience slightly different in the in the aspect that I might also combine doing spot radiation because I think of this more of a therapeutic than a palliative. And in my uh, clinical experience, I've seen maybe 20, 30, possibly 35 percent get a a palliative effect from the Zofigo, and so we will also do spot radiation in some of the areas that they're very symptomatic in. So I know you've got a very active bone clinic as well. 
and probably I would expect most of these patients are already on some element of bone targeting, anti-resorptive therapy. <clears throat> and I'm assuming you, you're using a lot of denosumab or, or zoledronic acid. Do you, because there's no data on that, obviously, especially with DMAB, are you continuing them with the denosumab plus radium-223? That's a great question. I've sat down with Paul Silver a number of times, because Siever, excuse me, because, you know, again, very experienced in uh, bone health. I think, and then in some Assad's data, when he looked back at uh, the uh, efficacy and if you could get the number of treatments in, that not only did combining with enzalutamide and Abby was very well tolerated, but also with DMAB, that these guys did have an overall improvement in survival. So that kind of lends some credence to continuing them on their DMAB, and that's what I've been doing at this point in time. Again, as long as the insurance company will continue to pay for it in that kind of regard. All right. Yeah. I agree with you. I, I think I fundamentally think in the United States we overutilize uh, the Nisumab and solendronic acid, and uh, I don't believe uh, with the data that we have that uh, solendronic acid has any role in prostate cancer. Uh, I think that if, if you look at uh, the utility and the data that actually we used to approve solendronic acid from back in the days until now, you know, uh, it used to be the agent, the Nisumab in the CRPC space with metastasis did better than uh, solendronic acid. Solendronic acid doesn't have any phase three data looking at uh, bone, uh, bone, bone loss reduction. So I, I think of prostate cancer patients for bone health in three ways. Those in whom I need to minimize bone loss, those in whom I may want to delay an SRE, and, and those who actually may, may need symptom control for an SRE. So, so which is again the term that, that Al Simca used, which is not a skeletal related event, but a skeletal symptomatic event, which is because we didn't mandate scans in Al Simca. I think the challenge is that uh, if you look independently, Abby alone has ability to delay SREs. ENS alone has the ability to do so. Prime to three alone can do that as well. So I'm not sure that my first thought when I see a patient with bone metastasis is, oh, I need to put you on the Nusumab because we're gonna delay your SREs. I think that I wanna actually control you systemically and I may introduce the Nusumab over time, but it's not the first gut reaction that I have when I'm seeing my patient. Now, it is fair to say that some of these people may have come with the Nusumab given every six months prolia for bone loss prevention, uh, and I may just switch them to every month, you know, but technically, having someone who gets docetaxel every three weeks, I'm not gonna give them the Nusumab every three weeks, so they may get the Nusumab every six instead of every three weeks. So, so I, I'm not sure, we don't have the data that the breast cancer group has with solendronic acid, which does lead to survival improvement, right? So I'm not sure that bone targeted therapy for SRE delay or reduction is the most important for our patients. I think the life prolonging treatments, you know, are number one, and then you can support them with whatever treatment you may think. But in the context of prostate cancer in any given stage, there is no role for solendronic acid. And I hope that Estampede actually settled that for men who actually had castration sensitive disease. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think this is, uh, again, it's, it's, we've had this explosion of all these new therapies. It's, it, it's really hard to kind of make sense of all the data, especially when it's all monitored. And, you know, it's like you said, clearly, clearly for, for DMAB at the exgeva dosing of 120 milligrams sub-Q monthly, that it's SRE prevention, so, so it, was, it was, not only was it not inferior, it was superior mm -hmm. to, to zoledronic acid, but for, for the urologist, that, sort of this concept of SREs, it was difficult for us to grasp for the mm. longest period of time. I do think, and, and we really didn't touch about, haven't really talked too much about this, I think where we really sort of missed the boat is when we do institute ADT and we understand the higher incidence of bone mineral density loss that clearly happens within the first couple years we don't do a good enough job of, of managing those patients. I, I think that's a real problem that we have. We know that when you look at the, when you look at the proceed registry, which is the post-marketing trial that Dendrion had to do, in the first 2,000 patients, and, we, and I think Matt Cooperberg, he's, he's looking at this data, that again, if you, if you say that 90% of patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer have bony mets, only 30% of those patients were actually getting anti-resorptive therapy, which is pretty dismal, <laughs> you know, I think. But again, I think this whole, this whole 
phone micro environment, you know, again, I think there's lots of questions. There's, there's, there's lots of, 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 I think, intriguing possibilities in terms of combining therapies with, with uh, you know, immunotherapy. Uh, Dan, I, I think Neil did a study looking at Abby and radium-223, correct? Sh showing that actually, you know, it, it can be safely combined. Um, comment, if you will, about that trial if you can. Well, again, I think it was a small N. I think it was something like 35, 40 patients. Um, but what he found was mainly that the side effect profile was minimally changed from what we had known if you'd used one agent on their own. So again, very good safety profile. And then he also, in the, I think it was from, it was in addition to what Saad was telling us from the early access program that again, these guys, their overall survival was also improved. Um, and, and when we looked at the data going forward. The, the, the SAD data, uh, to your point, you know, the, the issue with the SAD data is uh, only 20% of patients on the SAD data actually were having Abby and less than 5% or 7% were taking it. So it really actually doesn't reflect. I think as, you know, even though it retros retrospective, I think our series in America is probably the largest series actually looking at the combination therapy and what do you do. And I think that it, it does appear that mathematically people on combined therapy have a better out survival longer for that matter than historical uh, RIAM-223 alone. Uh, and clearly you settle the issue with PSA and soft tissue disease, right? Uh, because you don't have to be that dra dramatically worried if indeed you're taking an oral agent that has been effective for that patient. And didn't Fred Saad also report at ASCO this year that it's critical that you get in at least five injections of the of radium-225, five or six is the optimal that, that basically gets you to that, op that survival benefit versus patients that got four or less. I think he reported that at ASCO this year. He did, he did, and I, I think that that was really important in terms of where we're aiming with, with these patients. But I would also say it may be, too, that the sicker patients receive right. fewer cycles. So right. I would keep that in mind as I interpret that data. But, but of course, if we have something that improves survival and we have a goal of six, uh, and it looks like you're, they're doing better, then, then certainly we should aim for that.